All right, well, thanks for coming. Um, as, as advertised, this is going to be recorded so that I can, we can put it on the website. There's a, there's a section on the website called, called uh, Fiscal Year 15, School Budgeting, Budget Planning. Uh, so it contains the documents we presented thus far and presentations and whatnot. So those will be included with that. And it's, it's the purpose of this. This is something I started doing a few years ago in a different school division. And it started as a result of um, just a lot of misinformation about the budgeting process in Virginia and how funds are allocated and where funds come from and um, what the timeline looks like. And in Virginia, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated process. It's not simple to sort of follow and understand. So um, the benefit of doing something like this, not only for you folks, but it's to have it on the website uh, for people's review and whatnot. And um, I've got my fact fact checker right here and I've got John here also thank you John check my facts as well so let's get started in terms of uh, adopted revenues this sort of lays out where the money came from in term where our money comes from how it's allocated or what, what the sources of our allocations are and uh, I've mentioned a couple times this year that you know just in starting this year as superintendent as a new superintendent you know I heard comments about where money comes from and the majority comes from the state, and in fact, the majority does not come from the state. The majority comes from the locality. It's just over 60%. So of our, of our budget, roughly $129 million budget, uh, that's how it's broken out. About a third comes from the state. The majority is the locality. Uh, federal is about 3%, and that's, that fluctuates a little bit. It's fluctuated in the wrong direction uh, for next, next fiscal year because of sequestration that hurt the budget a little bit. And the other category are things like grants, tuitions, fees, student fees, things like that, which ought to be included in the budget in that bottom line figure. How the money is spent. Um, these are, are um, sort of the, the categories where the state expects us to uh, report. So anytime there's dollars spent, they have to fit into one of these categories. And if you'll see down here in the bottom, 80% goes towards instruction. That's a very, very good statistic. Because the state requirement is, or it's not a requirement, the state guideline is that we spend roughly 65% of our money towards instruction. And it's nice to know, and that number has changed to 80%, but one of the things I presented said 76%. Oh, okay, we added technology to that line. So that's a very, very good figure. 80% of our dollars go towards instruction. But uh, most of that is in all these categories are for salaries and benefits. So you see the other categories, administration, attendance and health, transportation, facilities management, and construction. Right, um, direct aid to public education, as you hear and learn more about um, um, the governor's budget, for example, and the money being put into um, K-12 public education, it's typically put into one of these different categories. And I don't know that off the top of my head now, but I know that, you know, in the governor's proposed budget, for example, there's about $580 million in new K-12 spending. And when you hear that, typically it's gonna fall into one of these different categories. Not federal funds, because that's, federal funds flow through the state budget, but they're, you know, it's federal funding, it's not state funding. But typically it falls into one of those categories. Standards of quality, uh, standards of quality are sort of the minimum expectations. And um, so when we receive, um, it's a, a template from the governor's office after the, or from the state, from the Virginia Department of Education. And they, they'll provide us a, with a template. We plug in our anticipated ADM and it'll sort of tell us um, where, what our different funding levels are based on standards of quality. So in other words, if we have 11,000 students in our school division, that means we have, the state will provide funding for, I don't know, 700 teachers or something like that. This is sort of off the top of my head. But those SOQ guidelines are, um, they're established by the state. That's how they determine how much money individual school systems receive, and it's based on their enrollment. But it's sort of a minimum number. There's very few school divisions in the state of Virginia that provide funding at that minimal level. You'll typically, typically find them 
south side, southwest Virginia. Um, but there's very few school divisions that do that. Most school divisions fund above the SOQ minimum levels, typically. Okay, the composite index. I need to talk about this just a little bit. Um, you probably heard something about this recently. This is something I've talked about, and it's been in the papers. Uh, every two years, the, um, the state does a calculation. It's called the Local Composite Index of Ability to Pay. And they take several different categories, and I think this is contained in a different slide. They take this information based on uh, tax receipts, value of property, et cetera, and they determine based on that information how much the locality should pay towards the local budget. And it's recalculated every two years. So we just experienced a new calculation of our local composite index of ability to pay. And it went up two points. And it was the 12th highest increase in the state. So when that composite index goes up, what that means is um, just in very general terms, well, the locality's done, had a couple of good years in terms of land values, um, tax, tax uh, collections, property tax, real estate tax, um, sales tax, et cetera. So uh, they, re they recalculate that and produce your local composite index. So ours went up two, two points. That's a big increase. And that, what that amounts to is $1.4 million less in state funding for us. So that's, that's a challenge that we're going to have. Uh, it's, now, it's going to be offset by additional money that's been pumped into K-12 education in the governor's budget, governor's proposed budget. But still, it's $1.4 million less in state funding for Fauquier County Public Schools. And that's a challenge. And as I mentioned, it's, you know, those SOQ funding levels are based on your enrollment. How many kids you have for the most part. Okay, that's, these are the things I just talked about, and these are a lot more details, but um, you'll see if you go to the middle section, formally use, the formula uses three indicators, true value of, of real estate property in the locality, adjusted, Virginia adjusted gro gross income in the locality, and taxable retail sales in the locality. So take those three things and determine sort of what your, what your, lo your local composite index of ability to pay should be. Um, and it's done every two years. And you can see it right here. So this is, this is the actual increase. Went from 5.5377 to 5584, two points, roughly two points. And that's a lot of money. That's a big, that's a big swing. Typically, the swings are much smaller. This is a big swing in the local, local composite index for us. All right, the state budget process, all right, just, um, and again, these are things you've probably heard about, and board members, senior staff, they know a little bit about this from uh, the different budget presentations and hearings and whatnot. But, you know, the governor produced his budget December 20th. There was some good news within that budget. There was, there was 580-some-odd million dollars proposed for K-12 public instruction. That's, that's very good. Uh, not great, but certainly better than what it's been in the past in very different years. Uh, the next step, of course, is for those committees within the House and the Senate to consider a plethora of bills um, relative to spending. And there are several bills currently in committee related to K-12 instruction that will or potentially will impact our funding. Uh, we were just reading about some today. There's several out there. So all that, all that to say there's a lot of energy surrounding K-12 public construction in this next biennium budget. There's a lot of interest in trying to do more for K-12 public construction. And that's a positive thing. So there's lots of bills. There's four separate bills re relative to uh, SOL testing. It has nothing to do with money, really. But four related to, at least four related to SOL testing. There's four related to the A through F school grading. Uh, there's a couple different bills that are uh, designed to hold school systems harmless who were hurt by composite index, which we were. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of good positive things happening within the General Assemblies and the Governor's Office relative to K-12. So uh, those, those things happen within the Appropriation and Senate Finance Committees. They're considering spending bills, et cetera. There's another spending bill uh, that's a, a actually a, what do they call that, a, 
not a caboose bill, but it's attached to the appropriations bill relative to the 6% teacher raise. What do we call that? Amendment to the appropriations that would re provide a 6% raise for teachers. It's a match raise. So the state would provide 3%. School divisions and localities would provide the other 3%. But I've heard nothing about that bill other than the bill exists uh, and it's in committee. And so hopefully it'll come out of committee with thumbs up. It'll get the support it needs to get out of committee and to be considered as part of the crossover. So those amendments and those changes to the budget to the budget go from the House, the Senate, they cross over and then they're considered by the opposite House. And then ultimately there's a conference, conference committee resolutions where they sort of all make nice and compromise and come up with a budget. Um, government reviews and, sign and, and signs the bill, but there's a piece of this that's um, important to remember. We have a new governor, so he'll have his own amendments to the budget. His, he'll have his own amendments to the governor's budget. And he's already uh, put out information about several. Uh, one was the um, piece I'd mentioned just a moment ago relative to hold the hold harmless, holding some school divisions harmless who were hurt by the composite index. There's some money for that. Uh, the cost of competing in Northern Virginia. There's some money there to, to help with that because there was some of those funds were eliminated. So there, there is some funding there to help out s some school divisions in Northern Virginia. But what we don't know yet is if they're considering us Northern Virginia or not. We don't know that yet. But if they are, then there potentially is a little bit of money there to help with the cost of competing reductions that have uh, occurred. Now, and w another thing quickly. Um, this, this is a much longer process. This is a long session because it's the first year of a biennium budget. The governor produces a two-year budget. So this is the first year of a biennium budget. It's going to take longer to uh, get it enacted, plus you have a new governor. So when that happens, you know, that first, of, by virtue of the fact that it's the first year of a two-year budget, it takes a longer time. And then you have a new governor who's going to propose his own amendments to the existing budget, proposed budget. That's going to elongate the process even more. So it potentially could be a very long session. But that's not unusual, it's just, it's just kind of the way it is. All right, and, and what happens in Fauquier County is typical of what happens in any school division in the state of Virginia. It's just sort of the way it works. The Board of Supervisors has taxing authority. School board does not. That's another one of those misconceptions out there among some that think that the school board has the ability to tax. We don't. Uh, that, that lies within the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and you, you're probably familiar with how that money is generated with, in the locality. Uh, property taxes, other local taxes, permits, fees, et cetera. In fiscal year 2014, the local revenues were $129.9 million. Uh, and their support for public education in that same year was $78 million, uh, 400000 That was 60%. I think 60% when, when um, I know there's, in the past there's been some uh, legislation, proposed legislation, that would require localities to fund schools at at least 60% of their local budget. That's not law, but that's, that's it's sort of a guideline, I think. I hear that, that number a lot relative to the local support for public schools. It's usually about 60%, give or take, of their local budget goes towards um, pub, their public school system. Of course, BOS also also funds other governmental agencies, public safety, judicial administration, general government, parks and rec, libraries, community development, lots of different other agencies. But typically, school divisions are the largest piece of any lo local budget, when we're no different. We're the largest piece of the local budget in Fauquier, as is in most, most places. Uh, so I've, heard a I've read a little bit about what other agencies are looking to do. I know the Commonwealth's Attorney's Office, you may have read about, they're hoping to um, uh, I guess create a cold case division um, to you know, wrap up some cold cases and that costs money because it requires people to do that. Lawyers, investigators, etc. So it's expensive. So there are other requests out there besides ours obviously. Uh, the Fauquier County budget process, um, well I proposed my budget on the 27th of January. Uh, submitted that to the school board and um, this, I guess this meeting is just a part of that process, but prior to that, we had a pre-budget public hearing, which occurred. I proposed my budget. Then we'll have another public hearing coming up soon. Um, the school board will hopefully approve my proposed budget. 
submitted to the county administrator. The county administrator, in the timeline, in just a minute I'll show you, um, he has his own timeline for producing and um, proposing his budget. Don, do you know what that date is when he proposes his budget, Paul? Do you know, you know the date of that? Paul's county administrator. Well, oh, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, well, the county administrator will propose his own budget after you know getting our request, getting my pro uh, proposed budget. Hopefully, if if the, our board school board approves my budget. And that goes on to, uh, to, for consideration by the county administrator. Uh, ultimately, our, of course, our proposed budget or approved budget goes on to the Board of Supervisors. There's another public hearing, and this Board of Supervisors then adopts an appropriate budgets and adopts tax rates. And then the school board ultimately adopts the fiscal year budget. And that throughout this process, of course, there's adjustments made because our proposed budget is for $5.1 million in new, in new local funding. So um, let's say that for some inexplicable reason we're not funded at the full $5.1 million level, uh, we'll have to go back and adjust our approved budget. We'll have to go back and make changes to our budget uh, to account for um, not the, the non-full funding of the $5.1 million request, which is, again, very typical. But that all takes time. And this is the budget timeline. Um, and as I said, it's, it, it may be somewhat longer this year because it, for the two reasons I mentioned, it's a long session and we have a new governor and things will take a little bit longer. Um, as an example, I don't know if you read Governor McAuliffe. Governor, governor McAuliffe talked recently about the A through F grading system and you know, he's opposed of it. It's already law, but he's opposed to it. And, wants to see it go away, and those kinds of things can ultimately end up elongating the entire session, General Assembly session. Um, but we are, in, again, I presented my budget on the 27th of January, um, and looks like the 27th of February will be the time when um, our county administrator approves or proposes his budget to the Board of Supervisors, and then that's when we'll know what our proposed allocation is uh, from the county administrator, and then that will, that may change again because the Board of Supervisors will take that request, consider it along with all the other requests, and then they'll come out with their their budget. So, you know, things change. This is a sort of a, a constantly moving and changing uh, process. But some things are coming up soon, um, and I, I don't have the exact dates of any of these things, so I'm going to let Marcy. Can you give us the exact dates of the... Um, Paul's uh, proposing the proposal that Paul will come forward with relative to his budget. And, and then when's the, pub, the hearing or the meeting between the two boards? Uh, the joint session is March 13th. Okay. And then there's another BOS public hearing shortly thereafter. Uh, March 18th. Okay. Yeah, this, Yeah, you know, if, if you don't want to write it all down, this, this actually is on the main web page, this presentation, and it's got the exact dates for all these things on this timeline. So if you go to the main web page, and you'll see on the quick link section, it'll say fiscal year 15 um, budget timeline or, or budget process. Click on that, and you can find this timeline. It'll have all these dates laid out. Now, I want to go back just quickly and talk about just for a moment about the energy I was referring to. Um, there is, I've been, again, and this is my fifth or sixth year now as a superintendent of Virginia, never seen this much energy surrounding K-12 education. Um, I believe this is uh, the $580 million that Governor McDonald proposed is in his budget is uh, the most I can remember being proposed or, or uh, proposed for K-12 public instruction. Um, that's a real positive thing. And all the spending bills that are sort of out there in committee uh, being considered that are written in order to help K-12 instruction, those are all positive things. So there is a lot of energy um, and a lot of goodwill right now for public instruction. 
but how that plays out in the end, I don't, don't really have any idea. Um, Governor McAuliffe, he has proposed a few amendments and some involve money for, for instruction for uh, public schools, but if they're, whether or not they're approved or not, I don't know. But there is some extra money there uh, earmarked for the cost of living, or excuse me, cost of competing, uh, and then the hold harmless, which I mentioned. So it's, it, it's truly a, a very complicated process, um, and I, I, I don't see it changing significantly. I, I doubt it will change much at all. Uh, I do think that, um, I think optimistically, I think what's being proposed from uh, Governor, Mc, uh, Governor McAuliffe to, excuse me, Governor McDonald to Governor McAuliffe, I think things will actually improve. I think that funding level will, is going to improve somewhat. How much, I don't know, but I think it is going to get a little bit better. So I'm fairly optimistic. All right, what did I miss? Nothing? Should I leave anything out? <laughs> You'll tell me later. Thanks. You know what you should have said? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'll stop now for any questions that you might have, because that's a, a tremendous amount of information. And as I said, we'll post this. And there's another presentation already posted uh, that has exact dates on different meetings and whatnot. But what questions are out there about budgeting 101 in Fauquier County? Yes, ma'am. that I think we need more money for schools. So for school construction or schools in general? Well, maybe in addition to Auburn or something. Well, I'm going to let Janice Bourne address that one, because actually in addition to Auburn is in the CIP, so she can speak to that quickly. Um, we have proposed some middle school uh, growth and renovation in the capital improvement program that the school board approved and we forwarded to the county. What the county does is just like they do with the budget for the CIP, they look at what we're proposing as well as what the county and some of these other um, agencies are proposing and then they determine what they can afford. They estimate their revenues and determine what they can afford. Um, we did propose an expansion to Auburn and a renovation to Taylor Taylor's been in our request for a long time now. Um, but we also understand that we, meaning the school board, needs to do some work as far as what we really want at Taylor because we had a study done in 2004 and our edu educational program has probably changed since that time a little bit, especially at middle school because you know they're changing the program right now even. Um, so we, over the course of this next year, are going to be looking at what changes that might be, try to do a study and determine how we want to move forward with middle schools. Um, but we do, it starts with the school board, goes to the board of supervisors. They have to determine whether they want to give us the money, um, issue bonds, and pay the debt for that work. And so. Well, when Greenville was being built, I just saw it. Yes. Well, what we will do, in fact, um, Dr. Mitchell's sitting right behind you, and I did just speak with her um, over the last couple of weeks. We're going to start a conversation with our schools, on our middle schools, on what do we need at the middle schools. And I'm sure that will expand as well as we... Um, in, in trying to decide what do we really need for um, middle schools. Dr. Jack will have his program that he'll want as well. So the conversation is going to expand from the school division and then go on to the Board of Supervisors, and I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to work with us on that. Um, there's really two opportunities for you to speak. One is at the school board public hearing about the budget, and that is on... Uh, February 24th 
and then our budget after we approve it we hear from all the public about what they think about our budget and then we send our approve our budget it goes to the Board of Supervisors and then they will have a public hearing and the date I have down for that is um, March 20th so uh, you speak at the one for the school board and then I would uh, suggest that you go to the public hearing for the Board of Supervisors and and speak there also or send them a letter or email or something like that so there's two opportunities I think it's important also we've talked about you know growth study planning that that's critically important because you I mean you can have hunches about what you think might happen and where the gro growth might be or where you, where you feel it might be but I, you know I f I'm more comfortable leaving that to the experts to, to study it and tell me precisely where the growth will be and where you're going to need additional classrooms etc and there's people that will you know, do that Weldon Cooper is one for example that they do that for a living and you know everyone has different opinions about where the growth is coming etc but it's good to pay a little money and get the, the, the professionals to tell you where it's going to be and what it's going to look like yes sir Clarification on the composite index. You said that when the state is calculating that, part of that comes from uh, one of the variables was on gross income for the county. Were you talking about gross income for all the county's residents or gross income for the county's government? Uh, revenues, uh, tax revenues, okay. uh, revenues from um, property tax, income, t or not income tax, but sales tax, things like that. Um, and it's relative, it's, it's, it's relative to every other locality in the state. So it's, for example, if our, our index went up two points, the conventional wisdom in Fauquier County might be, well, it didn't seem like we had that great a year. We did okay, but gosh, that seems like a lot, huge increase. It might be just be that relative to other surrounding counties, we did much better than they did. Um, I know a few years back in, in when I was in Greene County, which is a very poor county, you know, our index went up, same kind of thing, went up a couple points. And, we just couldn't believe it because we were a poor county, but we had, we owed the money, the state, a lot of money, or we got less money from the state, significantly less money from the state, and it was because our surrounding counties did terribly uh, with revenues and whatnot. When we did, you know, we built a Lowe's and a Walmart. That was a big deal, but that generated a lot of revenue for the county, and it made our index go up, so it cost us money. But that, there's, but there's three. There's, you're talking about revenues for the county. You're talking about tax revenues, proper, or excuse me, property tax revenues and income. I keep saying income tax, sales tax revenues. Okay, gotcha. But I was, I was just talking about the actual revenues for the county. <laughs> And one of the things that really hurts us in Fauquier County and in other counties like Fauquier is um, when the state does that calculation in terms of the value of your property, they're doing it based on you know, your fair market value, what the property is actually worth. Okay? 
but in Fauquier County, we have land use tax breaks, which are, which are fine. But that assessment is done based on you know, those land use tax breaks. So the value of the property is significantly less when they do their, those assessments. So but that's not what the state's looking at. The state's looking at how much the property in Fauquier County is worth, not based on you know, the assessed value after the, the um, land use tax breaks. They don't do that. So we kind of get a double whammy. There's less taxes collected locally based on land use, and then the state's looking at the actual fair market value of that property, and so you kind of get hit hard twice. But I mean, that, but I think those land, personal, those land use tax breaks are appropriate. But the state ought to look at that value, not the fair market value of that property. That would be fairer. There was actually a bill aimed at doing that. Senator Hanger proposed a bill uh, not this this biennium, but last biennium, which would take that away, just you know, take that unfairness away, I guess you'd call it. But it didn't. Uh, I don't think it even got out of committee. But there's a lot of places like Fauquier that are in the same category, same same situation. Um, I was wondering if you could um, kind of give some background on the 2013 pension reform and the mandatory increase in benefits that the school system has to pay into. Okay, well, um, you, I mean, you have to go back several budgets to, uh, you know, a, a time when the state government was, you know, A, borrowing money from uh, taking money out of VRS, uh, because there was a you know bad times with state budgets, so money was borrowed from the VRS fund, and then so there's that piece of it, and then the VRS fund itself it's a it's kind of like a money market fund, it's an investment account whatever fund, and it's not done well. So it's I think Marcy said it's at 62% of where it should be, so it's struggling, and the state is committed to making it solvent to maintaining that AAA rating, getting it back where it needs to be. And in order to do that, they came up with a formula that really, it's four biennium, four biennium budgets or three? Four, so it's three more. So over eight years, you know, there are certain requirements that are laying on localities to make that fund solvent again. And it's very expensive in order to do, and they, instead of, but instead of trying to do it all at once, they spread it out over eight years, which is, Good, good thing, I guess. Um, but it, what it means is over four biennium budgets or eight years means four huge, I wouldn't say huge, really significant increases to our VRS uh, payment, for lack of a better term. And this coming biennium, it's $2 million. And it, it, that will be the same for the next three. We'll, we'll have that bill for the next three biennium budgets. We'll be paying that bill to try and shore up VRS uh, for all, you know, all state employees. And it's, it's extremely expensive. But that piece, you know, the, the, the two big pieces, and Marcy, help me out here. The two pieces in terms of getting to her question, her answer, the answer to her question, how we got there, one was the state borrowing from the VRS fund, and two, the fund is not performing well at all. And the fear that money's not going to be there for folks when they retire. Yes, sir. that had the wherewithal to contribute to the VRS plan, the state actually precluded them holiday. from being able to do so. They basically made yep. a mandatory holiday. Right. So what the effect of that over the long term is that when you could have been making those contributions to VRS when the market was down, basically buying low, which is a really good market strategy, we were precluded from being able to do that. And so we haven't been able to realize the full impact of the market's correction over the last three to four years when they've been seeing 15, 17, 20% returns. And so now the reason why with schools, a lot of times you'll see the, um, what they call the funding ratio on these VRS plans is they're typically lower than some of the local government ratios because of the fact that the local governments weren't given that mandatory, you may not contribute. Right. And that's and a it, real big problem for schools. Yeah. And at the time, I mean, I can only speak for myself, it was a, it was a much appreciated holiday because it's when, it when things were tanking statewide. Yeah. Budgets were really struggling. So we got this holiday, and now we're paying for it. 
<laughs> you know, it's like back in the day when the, you know, they'd give you a visa, I gave you the month of December off. You know, you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay your bill on December, you get a holiday, but you're going to pay for it later with interest. That's basically, you're right, it's exactly what we're doing now, we're paying for it. The other part of pension reform is besides trying to get money into the fund itself, is they are tinkering with the benefits. So by reducing the benefits, that's the other portion of it. So it's kind of twofold. Mm -hmm. And so there's a brand new program that just started January 1st for new hires and people that are not currently in the VRS. So by reducing slightly the benefit of retirees and then put more money into the fund, they're trying to get back where they need to. And there was a bill that, uh, a proposed bill that was going to add two more years to the payback, add one biennium to the biennium to your cycle to pay back, but it was defeated. So we're back to where we were. Other questions? Anybody in the back have any questions? <laughs> well, as I like to say at the end of meetings like this, if you have questions after you leave, feel free to email, call, send me a question on Twitter, whatever is most comfortable for you. We'll post this. Um, I think we'll, we'll probably switch that timeline out to include the one that has the dates on it uh, so folks know exactly when those meetings are coming up. It's just kind of a little thing, but it is complicated, and, and hopefully we've helped just a little bit maybe explain why these things get so complicated and why it's so difficult to understand because it's you know i was thinking about this in the drive over here it's it's um there's a lot of opportunity for folks to feel like you're you know withholding information or not being 100 percent transparent because it's so complicated and it, even to try to explain it and mull your way through it and make sense of it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and it's not it's just not easy it's not easy to do but some of these bills like the vrs you know, increase, it's required. We do not, we don't have an option. We must pay that $2 million. We don't have a choice. It's a required benefit. So we, there, there are no options there. And then we have the benefits increase for health benefits is of about 5%, that's $600,000. And then the third link in the chain, which is the local composite index change, which takes state funding away. Just, just some challenges for us this next budget. We have some challenges we need to overcome, but we will, and we'll be fine. But it's just, uh, as I've said to the board, and, and we've, as we've talked about in senior staff, just to be able to do next year what we're doing right now in Fauquier County Schools is going to cost $1.7 million more. Uh, and that's just, that's just benefits. That's what that amounts to, benefits and uh, benefits increases and a little bit of loss, loss of state funding because of the composite index. So just keep that in mind. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate you coming. We'll have this posted shortly.